Um, we are in Luke uh, this evening and Luke chapter 10. And the reason that I think this is a helpful passage for us, thank you. The reason I think that this is a helpful passage for us is because as COVID sort of relents and uh, we get back to our normal routines of life, uh, that generally means that the machinery of life gets busy again and our plate begins to fill up and the things begin to fall off that plate. And in the midst of seeing our lives get busy, we begin to ask the question, what is, what is my life meant to be about? What is the purpose? Does it matter? Is it, am I accomplishing what I need to accomplish? Is it, uh, and then from a Christian perspective, we look at it and say, is my life uh, marked by a, a God-glorifying, Christ-exalting manner? Is it marked by things that matter to him? And we begin to ask these questions about our life and the existence of what we are about. And those are good goals to think about. But in the midst of that, sometimes we start to look back and think, where'd my joy go? Uh, I want to live for Christ. I want to live for him in my life. But my joy seems to have a leak in it. Uh, why is that? Where is the joy in, in my salvation, in my walk with Christ? And, and so the passage that I'm going to take us to tonight in Luke 10, I think is a passage written for the crazy busy and the joy hungry. And I think that that can be all of us at times or it will be soon. And so Luke chapter 10, verse 38, if you wouldn't mind standing yet again and, uh, and reading God's word with me this, uh, this evening. So let's read God's word and then I'll pray just a quick moment as we begin. Now, as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. But one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. Father, we thank you for the gift of your word. Jesus, we thank you that you said these words. Uh, you said them to Martha, but we imagine and know uh, that you very well could say them to each of us at some point in our lives. And you are saying them to us tonight. And I pray that your spirit would help us to respond to you tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You may grab a seat. Reading this passage, it makes me think of that image of, uh, you know, a teenager that's been brought into the principal's office, let's say, and he's about to get a talking to, right? So there he is sitting in the, in, in the chair and uh, maybe a parent comes or a counselor or whatever it is. And the, the, the conversation is sort of always has this one uh, phrase that, that gets said, you've got to get your priorities straight. And, uh, and so they could say, you know, you've got to get your life together, you need to get your classes done, you need to get your finances in, in order, you need to get a job, you need to get out of this thing, you need to get things in order, you need to get it together, you need to get your priorities straight. And here it seems that that's exactly the kind of conversation Martha is looking forward to having with her sister Mary. That she's wanting Jesus to engage her sister and have this very important conversation, but it ends up not going the way that she wishes. Both Mary and Martha extend an invite to Jesus to come for dinner, and he accepts. And they would have been ecstatic at the opportunity to host Jesus for a meal. And so the scene that, that happens directly after this invitation plays out very differently for two women. Mary goes one way, Martha goes another. Martha's determined to host an incredible party. And so she gets busy. She gets after it, and she works very hard. But something changes. Her service becomes anxiety-ridden and worrisome as she con considers, I can't get this done. I need help. And where's Mary anyway? Oh, she's over there, still sitting, hasn't moved an inch. And what's Jesus doing? He hasn't said anything at all. He doesn't care. And that's it. She just throws her apron to the ground and she goes after him and says, Jesus, you need to look at this lady and tell her you need to get your priorities straight. But then all of a sudden she finds out Jesus has a very different set of priorities than herself. And so what happens in this moment is that we in our, mo in our chaotic, overactive, and often attention deficit world, we are given a message by Jesus himself here that tells us that your busyness isn't necessarily your righteousness. It's not necessarily mine either. 
And so what's happening in this story is we have two different sisters with two very different experiences. You have Mary who is laser focused and unencumbered by the presence of Jesus. She would rather sit there at Jesus' feet and hear his words. The moment he arrives to the house, she is struck still. And she stops, and she listens, and nothing else matters. She's delighted. And Martha, she has done nothing but everything except watch Jesus. And she's furious. Two very different experiences. Now, I don't think that this story condemns busyness outright. You're going to have busy days. I'm going to have busy days. Your plate's going to get full. It's, it's okay to be busy. It's okay to have a moment where you need to shoulder the plow. You need to work hard. You'll have lots on your plate. But we are to notice the shock value of this moment that we are given in the New Testament. We're given this picture of the same scene which leads Jesus to look at the same woman, Mary, very differently than Martha looks at Mary. That's what's shocking about this moment. The same person, in the same moment, at the same party, one despises her and one delights in her. That's the shock. What's happening in Martha's heart that would make her look at Mary and say, she doesn't get it? See, Martha has done the inviting. She's opened her home. But now she says that she's distracted by much serving. Much serving. Now, you hear that word, and that word is always positive in the New Testament. Always positive to say you're serving. Even for Martha, in, in the New Testament, we have it again spoken that Martha hosts another party when Lazarus, her brother, is raised from the grave in John 12. They have another party, and it says again, Martha is serving. It's a good thing that she's serving. And yet, and even Jesus, when he responds to Martha... He responds to her very kindly, Martha, Martha. And so it's, it's not the serving per se that's the problem here. It's that she's distracted by much serving. And so what's happened here is that many efforts in her, in her serving are affecting her heart. I've heard it said this way, that it's, it's not that Martha is, has, her affliction is that she is a busybody. It's that she has a busy heart. She has a busy heart. She's distracted by much serving. And I'm sure they go together in some ways, the busyness and the busy heart. But what is the nature of the problem with having a busy heart? It means that her distraction made it impossible for her to look upon Mary from the kitchen or from the back room or where it was to look across the room and to see Mary and to have a delight in her heart for what she sees. Instead, she sees it with disgust. Something is off. Now, I've heard it said that there's a difference between, there's a difference between um, entertaining and hospitality. So that entertaining is, is when you uh, work extremely hard to host a, a family or a couple families for dinner. And perhaps you, you, you work, you sort of canceled a decent amount of appointments that morning so that you get everything just so by that evening. And you have a layout for the plan and for the dinner and everything's just so and you have it all organized. And there it is, all, all together. And then when the, as, the, as the dinner goes on, you want to make sure just everything arrives just in time. Dinner is hot when it needs to be hot. It's served when it needs to be served. And everyone knows that they're being entertained. But then you move into hospitality when you begin to maybe lose track of time. Uh, maybe the table isn't quite set when they get there. And you know dinner doesn't arrive at the same moment or when you thought it was going to be. And, and, and maybe you forgot you know, how to fill their glasses at the right moment and all those things because you got distracted with them. And you were focused on the people. They were there to be loved and spoken to and enjoyed. And so how often many of our efforts, many of the things that we do, the things that we get busy with, are tainted with a busy heart. This over-anxious desire to make things happen just so. And so for Martha, the more she gives, the more she works, the more disturbed she gets. And we have a word for this in our time, right? We call it burnout. And I don't really understand all of how to describe burnout for all of our experiences, I'd imagine, tonight. But uh, could it be that burnout is not as much about over-serving? It's not as much an over-serving problem as it is 
a heart problem. Not as much about the weight of what you're doing or done, but the reason for why you are wearing the weight and bearing it a certain way. Could it be that? That's the reason for your busyness, the reasons that became super draining. When that weight is held upon you, when duty replaces your delight, and then it becomes drudgery. When even the good things that you're part of, seeking to serve the Lord, love the Lord, follow the Lord in your life and all that you've been given, it becomes drudgery because it lacks that love and that peace and that joy that it once had. And it becomes overwhelming. It becomes overworking. It becomes used up. What do we do with that? Well, often when that happens, watch out because you're going to throw a really big fit. And that's what, she, uh, that's what Jesus sees with Martha. You know, kids, I told you to clean up the room. Wife or husband, I, I thought you were going to come through and you didn't. How could you? We all know those kinds of conversations. But, uh, but Martha's, Martha's is different because she actually says it to Jesus, right? She goes right to Jesus and she says this. Do you not care that Mary is doing this? It's a question that's actually been asked of Jesus before in the Gospels, uh, in Luke specifically, uh, asked by the disciples. So the disciples are on the boat. It's about to be swamped with water. Uh, they are in fear of their lives, and Jesus is asleep. And so they come to Jesus, they wake him up in the boat, and they say, Don't you care? Don't you care? We're about to drown. And uh, it's also been asked before um, Elijah. In the Old Testament, don't you care? I'm the only prophet. Jonah, don't you care? Nineveh's terrible. Are you really going to forgive them? How dare you? Moses, don't you care for God's people? They're your people. Uh, when we go through this moment of burnout and this moment of stress and, and life gets busy and we begin to feel like we have way too much on our plate and, uh, and all this stuff starts to come up, what really happens is what comes out of you is actually what you think of God. It actually pushes it to the surface, and so you can't help but say, this is what I really was thinking of God all along, but the stress really helped to notice it and to push it to the surface to ask that question, don't you care? And so I would, I would say to you tonight is, um, what maybe you need to hear is that perhaps the primary work that God is doing in your current stress or in your current struggles the primary work he's doing is, is inside you. And he's, what he's seeking to do is actually bring up what's going already going on in your heart to the surface so you'll see it. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a frustrating way to go through discipleship and change and transformation, but it's a very common one, I would say, in the book that God uses to change his people. And that he stresses you out on purpose to show you what was already there to begin with. To allow you to see what you believe about God. And so Martha is caught in what she believes about Jesus. He doesn't care. And so she asks about his priorities. Now, what's the very center of this story? Like, what's the point? Is it that Jesus, um, that there's two types of people in the world? There's busy people and lazy people. And surprise, Jesus likes lazy people. Is that, is like, that's the, is that the story? Um, it's not. Uh, what's... What's the center of this is that Martha can't see, right, the surprise of Jesus sees something Martha doesn't. The surprise is that Martha can't see what Jesus sees. And you know why? Martha doesn't want what Jesus wants. That seems deeper. Which also means Martha doesn't love what Jesus loves. That's terrifying. Martha doesn't love what Jesus loves. Something's off. That's the center of the story. And so just actually a few verses back from this moment, Jesus is praying. And he pray we hear his prayer and he prays out to God his Father. And he says, I praise you, Father. And he praises his Father for this. He says, your kingdom is being revealed. It's being revealed to children. Your gracious will is being revealed to children. He says it's not being revealed to those in wise understanding. And then directly after him saying that, you have the story of the, uh, 
the rich man, or the, you have the story of the Good Samaritan, right, which is actually a response to a man who says, I'm good enough, I've done everything right, right? You should just prove that he's wise in his own understanding, and Jesus basically confronts him that he's not. And here's the other story of someone who's not childlike in faith. Get your priorities straight, Jesus and Mary. No, guess what? There's one in this story who's showing profound childlike faith, and they are trusting in Jesus for who he is. That she had the faulty understanding of what was priority. And so her functional belief is that her effort is better than her ear. Her, her work is better than her worship. Her serving is more necessary than her sitting. And that's what's gone wrong. It may sound wise, but Jesus points out to Martha that it's this childlike faith and focus of your sister Mary that really was necessary all along. Can you see the surprising power that's in the Christian life altogether from this passage? A short moment, but it's descriptive of the entire Christian life, how you get in and how you stay in. It's the Christian life put on display, the whole source of our transformation, all kinds of spiritual power in your life you can access. Countless believers in the world right now are accessing this power and living in light of the power of Jesus from something like this. They are building their life on a childlike faith and focus on Jesus. And they're letting everything else go to the side. And it's changing them. Make it change us. The whole trust in Jesus in this simultaneous rejection of self and religious effort and all the things we think we could accomplish and just give us a little bit more time and I'll get through that book and I'll get through this accomplishment and I'll be the best guy after I do that, that and the other thing and I just got so much on my plate but eventually Jesus is going to like what I do. did a lot. But to actually hear to have a faith and focus on Jesus in his presence. So like Martha... When our activity takes central focus, it really reveals that's where our focus is, our activity, us. So religion, spiritual ways of life, uh, even secularism offers you non-spiritual advice, which is really still just spiritual, but it's, it's all directed to self-help, how you can do you to make yourself better. And again, just adds more stuff to more categories on your plate that you're in charge of. And so Martha's busy heart works for Jesus, but it's actually focused on herself. Mary's heart is set on Jesus, and she's pretty much lost track of herself. There might have been very many things she was supposed to get done that day, and they, she forgot them all, because Jesus is there. And so in this moment, Christianity is revealed that it's not simply doing what Jesus says, it is living in who Jesus is, and living in reliance on what he's done. It's living with your focus upon Jesus. Are you doing that? How is that going? How is that going as a, as a church and as, as believers? Are we, are we living our life focused on Jesus, enjoying him personally? It's hard. It's impossible. Without the Spirit of God opening our hearts to do such a thing. To like him more than anyone else. In Mary, we see this takes both her mind and her heart, actually. She's, it's not just a, an emotional uh, high that she's experiencing. It says that she's paying close attention to his words. She's listening to his doctrine. She's understanding what he's saying about all of reality. Like, there's no one more important to listen to than Jesus. And so she's taking it in in her mind. And she's ex accepting it in her heart. And she's laying her life upon it. So Mary is enjoying both the mind and the heart, enjoying what Jesus says. And she's taking a worshipful trust in it, and Jesus delights in that. He delights in that. Her faith and focus is on Jesus. In the Old Testament, there's uh, a story, it's not in Exodus, in Numbers. Uh, the Israelites are wandering through the wilderness, and there they, uh, they've rebelled against God again, and they're grumbling and complaining, and serpents come. There's serpents, and, and they come in great number, and they begin to uh, uh, bite many people there. And so they get this poisonous snake bites that are happening. 
And Moses cries out for his people and God's people cry out to, to him. And, and God says uh, to Moses, take a bronze snake and put it on a, a staff and lift it up before God's people. And nothing happens. No one's helped until they look upon it. Until they set their gaze upon that bronze serpent on the staff and then they're healed. And that small little moment is only a picture of the greater moment that you and I are in right now when there is Jesus who has been lifted up on a cross on display for the whole world, but nothing will happen. No sin will be healed. No one will be rescued from the sickness and pain and hurt of your hardships that you've turned from God. All of that will do nothing for you until you set your gaze upon what Jesus has done for you. And you place your faith and your focus upon it and you apply it personally by faith. Until you stop being Martha and you become Mary. And you enjoy who Jesus is and what he's done for you personally. Then you are healed. Then salvation comes. Then the poison is gone. When you look at Jesus. Have you trusted him that way? Have you placed your faith in him alone? Are you resting in him? Isn't it time if you haven't? What else are you waiting for? I know of no one else who can save you. No one else can help you like Jesus. Now, as you trust in Jesus, as we accept what Jesus has done, as we look upon Jesus, I, I will tell you, your life's going to get busy still. There's going to be a lot on your plate. There will be a lot you need to do. As a believer, there'll be more. There's going to be a lot on your plate. Like even the, the, the answer to the Good Samaritan, you know, who is my neighbor? And Jesus basically shows them that everybody's your neighbor. You've got a lot of people to love and a lot of people to serve in this life, and it gets busy quick. So, our life is no picnic. It's, it's a large and a hard endeavor. There's a lot on your plate, but the question is, how are you holding your plate? Are you going to hold it like Mary, or are you going to hold it like Martha? See, it says that Mary, not Martha, what Jesus says to, to Martha in this is he, he says, it's Mary, not you, Martha, who has the one thing that is necessary. And she has chosen the good portion, and it won't be taken from her. That word necessary means crucial, it means needed, it means you can't get anything else besides this first. This is the primary thing. The good portion or the chosen portion is uh, you lose everything else if you don't get it. This is the main thing. It's like if you, you go for a picnic and you say we have the buns and we have the, the ketchup and we have the mustard and we have the plates and we have the chips, but nobody's cooked burgers. There's none here. It's the chosen por portion. Who wants a, 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 a bread sandwich with ketchup on it? No one does. It's the main thing. It's sort of, it's not a good picnic if you don't have this. It is the main thing. You, you have to have a faith and focus on Jesus first before you do anything for him, before any of it is worth anything. And so Jesus says that this faith-filled worship in me, it won't be taken from Mary. And so he stops and says, Martha, Martha, let me offer it to you. This is the chosen portion. This is the necessary thing. This is the non-negotiable. Everything else can fall off the plate but this. And we have the same call. It's the same for us. Being near Jesus in worship, trusting him, paying close attention to him, going to him in his word, uh, is the non-negotiable of your life. Listening to him as you would listen to the final words of your, of your loved one. It should be the closest thing to your life. And so it's the same call. And so how convicting it is. Right? How being near Jesus, going to his word, paying attention to what he has to say is often, if we're honest, some of the most begrudged moments of our day. Going to hear more truth from Jesus sometimes feels like the last thing on the list. And that we would rather sit in our worry and our anxieties a little longer before we go sit in Jesus' presence and seek peace. But what an offer. What an offer we're given. The offer of life and help and peace and power. The, the offer of transformation, the offer of true discipleship is tied to this first and foremost necessity of your life. A personal loving focus on Jesus. A loving dependence upon 
him. This is where all other things take second priority to it, to our worship and communion with with Jesus, to abiding in him, he says, and you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do just a few things. No, he says you can do nothing. But abide in me. And so when we do not abide in him, that's when life gets pretty, pretty hard and disgruntled and uh, dissatisfying and service just becomes hard work and we use the words burn out. Not because the service itself is wrong, but because it wasn't done from a present experience of the love of Jesus. Now, I love Paul's description of his motivation, the Apostle Paul. He says, it was the love of Christ that compels me to do this. Nothing else is strong enough to do what Christ says, but the love of Christ. And so it's either for him in this way, or it's really just a veiled way where it's become about us. I heard it said that if your aim is at delight, you're going to get duty thrown right in. But if you aim at duty, you'll get neither. You'll get neither. And we get a grasp of the danger of this from a passage like this, but from Jesus as well, when he says, as the risen and ascended Lord to his church in Revelation chapter 2. And so I'll read these words for you if you'd like to find them in Revelation chapter 2, verses 3 to 5. But this is what Jesus says to one of the churches in Revelation. He says, I know, he says, I know your works, your toil and your patience. I know you're enduring patiently and bearing up for my namesake. So far, so good. And you've not grown weary. Great. But verse 4. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love that you had at first. Remember there from before from where you have fallen and repent. He calls them back to that love of Christ that's meant to compel them all along. Because duty will drain right out. And living without that joy, it'll become noticeable and it's deeply dangerous. Friends, I must tell you that in order to get some help from Jesus, if this is your experience, is it, it takes, starts with honesty. Just honesty with Jesus, uh, with, with being distracted from him. Saying, like, I've been distracted. I've been in the back room doing a whole lot of things, both serving you and serving others, serving myself. And I realize that I'm, I've not been near you. And, and so being honest with that, it really is the story of the whole world. So by you being honest, you're basically just saying the exact thing that everyone really should say, which is that the, everyone in the world is born distracted with Jesus. Everyone in the world is born not liking him. Everyone in the world would rather anyone else be in their life but him. That's how we start. And so the reality is we're simply confessing that that's the na nature of our rebellion, that, that we like doing everything else but going to God. And so we're honestly saying that that's still in us, that nature, that struggle is still there. And we're confessing it to now one who loves our soul and who has died for rebels and runaways like us. And he's called us home. And so we're being honest with the fact that we like going away from him. And we like being distracted. And so, Lord, forgive me. Change me. I want to see your grace all the more. I want to know your love. Because it's the graciousness of God to runaways. It's the graciousness of Christ the loving offer of his forgiveness is what's going to move your feet to become a standstill again. And it's going to want to make you grab a seat and sit and hear more from Jesus. It's his gracious love for you that's better than anything else in this world that's going to make you want to stop and listen. And so honestly facing that, but then looking at who he is and what he's done for you will make us say, this is my sweet and lovely, powerful and good and strong savior. And I want to be near him and him alone. That'll change you. There is much to work to be done. But you must not lose this necessary connection to the one whom empowers your activity. When was the last time you sat at the feet of Jesus and you listened to his voice and you enjoyed his presence? Uh, coming to gather together as God's people on a Sunday evening? Absolutely a part of it. Like how necessary it is to come to service and to be a part of God's people and to listen to his, his, to listen to his word, to sing his praise, to pray prayers with one another when we don't feel, feel like it at all either. To come all the more and to say, man, I need, I know I remember needing Jesus. So even if I come to service, it'll help me remember that I do. And it'll bring all of this back to fruition in my heart 
and so how ne- necessary it is to be near Jesus. But also, are you personally doing this? Are you in daily experience seeking to go to God's word, resting in what Jesus has done for you? Not just filling your mind, but letting it expose your heart and, and being near the words of Christ like you're near the closest words of a friend. How important it is, right, that the Bible doesn't just become words, but it is a personal relationship with Christ. And sort of walking into the scriptures that way. I know that I know that as a church and churches, we want this for one another. This is what we desire for each other. This is the one thing that is necessary. And I think so often we think that it's this distant activity that doesn't actually uh, do much. Maybe it's a mundane thing to go to God's word and just to spend time with Jesus. And it doesn't seem to, to it's, there's so much on our plate to get after that it's hard to stop and to be near Jesus. And I understand that feeling. But I want us to make sure before we end tonight is that you see that the greatest act of service is actually created from Mary in this story. That the greatest act of love I've ever seen happen in Jesus' earthly ministry is produced by her sitting with Jesus. Martha and the disciples didn't see it, even Mary didn't see it at the moment, but it happens later. So in John chapter 12, they have a party again for Jesus. And Lazarus has come, uh, risen from the grave. They have another huge party, um, and Martha is serving, and Mary comes back into the room. But this time she comes with something in her hands. She says here that she took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Uh, None of us have given a gift like this to Jesus, I would imagine, if you monetarily did the sums. Uh, It's very expensive. To the extent that Judas looked at this as like, this is ridiculous, what she just did. We could have done a lot of the other things with this money. People misunderstood the gift. To the surprise and frustration of many, Mary's worshipful position at Jesus' feet made her ready to offer the greatest act of love and service we'd ever seen for Jesus. This perfume, uh, this ointment would have been so strong, you perhaps would have smelled it on Jesus at his crucifixion. Jesus actually says to Mary, uh, what you have done is in preparation of my burial. And so in the end, being at the feet of Jesus, doing nothing but being at the feet of Jesus in faith and focus on him, produces in this woman something that looks a lot like Jesus. Sacrifice. Love, joyful service, and a lot of self-forgetfulness in the midst of it. Our faith, our focus, our love, our considered and focused connection to Jesus is what can produce in you a change that looks like nothing this world could ever see and do on its own. A sacrifice that's able to be born out of being near Jesus. Because being near him eventually rubs off on us. I was talking with a man today who retired just this year. And it's like he, he's gotten to that finish line, retirement. And I asked what he's going to do. And he's actually come here from Edmonton. He's in a sister church of ours in, uh, in Edmonton. And he's traveling to see us and other churches because he needs a bit of support because he's going to go give four or five years to Turkey. And he's going to go share his faith in Istanbul with eyes wide open of what he's about to go face because he's been there a few times. But he said, this is, I can't get away from it. This is what should be done. They need Christ. What makes a person do that? What makes people move into that? What makes someone uh, point to their teenage children who do not want them to talk about Jesus anymore, mom or dad, and you keep doing it? You keep telling them about Jesus. What makes people do that? What makes people talk to their, 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 their someone at work who has a real say in their job security, yet again talk to them about their faith in Jesus Christ? What makes someone do that? We are going to be misunderstood. And we may be completely despised in some ways for the things we do for, this, for the Lord in this life. That can only be explained by looking and being near Jesus. Looking at Jesus and being near him. And in his presence. 
And so my prayer as we close tonight would be that you will be like Mary, misunderstood for the things that you do, the things that you say, because of the radical nature by which you give your life away to Jesus in this life. And it can only be understood because people say, I know who he's been near. That he had and she had what was most necessary. And it won't be taken from you. You were with, you were with Jesus, weren't you? You were with Jesus. Let's pray and go with, be with him more and more. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are a savior worth being near. And that's not trumped up. I mean, the, compare you to anyone and we find everything lacks but you. And so, Jesus, we thank you for your love, your power, your goodness, your mercy, your grace, and the fullness that you are. And we ask that you would convince us because we know we're stubborn and often turn to other things. It gets so distracted. And so we turn back to you again tonight and say, uh, win us again, we pray. Win our attention, win our hearts, and draw us near to your presence yet again, we ask. For the fullness of our joy and your great glory, we ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen.